We are here with Dr. John Sheely from Michigan State University. Dr. Sheely grew up in a rural community of Hudson, Michigan as the oldest boy in a family of 14 children. He was active in horse and livestock industry from a very early age, which led him to enroll at Michigan State University and earn his BS degree in animal husbandry in 1973. He managed the horse center at MSU for 12 years. He received his MS degree in animal husbandry in 1980 and his PhD in 1984 in animal science at Michigan State. In 1984, he was hired 100% teaching appointment by Michigan State to develop the horse program in the Department of Animal Science. He started the two-year Institution of Agriculture Technology Horse Management Program and began to develop the BS program in animal science with an emphasis in horses in 1984. Dr. Sheely pr presently teaches six courses in animal science, advises 90 undergraduates, and serves on four graduate committees. The horse faculty has grown from one faculty position to now six. He presently serves as a faculty coordinator for the Horse Teaching and Research Center, is the horse section coordinator with oversight responsibilities for teaching, extension, and research activities of this group. He is also the coordinator of undergraduate programs in the Department of Animal Science. So we can welcome Dr. Sheely and tonight's presentation will cover brood mare nutrition. Thank you. Welcome everyone. I'm glad you could be with us. Looks like we've got a small group which is maybe a little bit indicative of some of the trends we see right now in breeding horses. I, I wondered how popular this segment might be because we're seeing in every horse right now a real downturn and no, <clears throat> well not every breed of horse but in a very large majority of horses a real downturn in number of breeders I'm curious as to how many people people we would have it looks like we've got a small group but that will that will even make it a little easier for us The objectives tonight are things I've kind of I would kind of like to talk about. Is first of all think about the nutritional classes for the broodmare. Think of the broodmare as being essentially one nutritional. The reality is is that she goes during a year she goes through stages in her life where she actually goes from from one to three classes. So we'll try to define those just a little bit. Then we'd like to define the nutritional requirements for each of those classes as that mare progresses through the year from the mare that is open to pregnant to late pregnancy and then into lactation. Try to get those those uh, requirements for each of those classes kind of generally. And we'd like to determine the feedstuffs that can be used to meet these requirements. Then I'd like to identify practical recommendations. The truth is that you could we could run a course and what we're going to talk about tonight in 40 minutes we could talk talk about for as many as four or five hours and if we really wanted to get you proficient we'd probably try to develop some opportunities for you to learn to formulate diets that's not the intention of what we're going to try to do tonight no sense for us to look at this and and try to come up with some practical recommendations I always think one of the things that I always try to tell students when we deal with management is we're really dealing with um, kind of risk management. And what, are, what do I mean by that? I mean, what are the risks of something horrible happening if we handle a group of horses all very similarly? And in many cases, that's very, very low. And I always try to emphasize the fact that what we do is we manage horses or we manage a group of horses to a... <laughs> um, we manage a group of horses as if they're all the average of the population and then when we start dealing with horses um, that are exceptions we manage them as the exception and so what I want to do is kind of identify what are practical recommendations for those horses that are going to fall into what we will define as the normal category they don't have any special considerations in regard to um, special needs uh, genetic variation in the way in which they need to they they need to be fed those sorts of things and we'll try to address some of those as we progress through the, the <clears throat> excuse me well we we've not talked about trying to get the mare pregnant and that that's a whole talk unto itself 
but when we start talking about the pregnant mare, we can kind of lump them into three categories. Early pregnancy, um, late pregnancy, or the last trimester, and then lactation. When we look at um, early pregnancy, we can get more specific, and we can break it down from months one through eight. And their nutritional requirements are somewhat different throughout that period, although they don't vary mu much by, from month to month because the fetus is not rapidly increasing in size during this period. So the mare is not laying down a lot of extra tissue, and so her needs do not change dramatically. Mares normally mature, I and mean, we generally don't start breeding horses until they're at least three years of age, and in many cases, much older than that. And as a result of that, that mare's nutritional requirements for maintenance are relatively low. She's not got a go she doesn't have a growth requirement. She doesn't have an exercise requirement unless we're exercising her otherwise. And so therefore her requirements are relatively low. Uh, maybe this is one of the things we always need to consider. Many mares in those one through that those months one through eight, she may be lactating while she's in early pregnancy. That mare is not fed as a pregnant mare. She's fed as a lactating mare. Pregnant mares do not require, especially in the early months of pregnancy, don't have the same kind of requirements in regard to total nutrient needs as a mare in, in early lactation or in lactation period. Therefore, she's going to be fed at above what we're talking about for these standards in regard to kind of estimating what's going to happen through the... Practically speaking, when we start talking about how they may vary from month one through month three and one, month three through month uh, seven and month eight. Um, practically speaking, we can't change diets that frequently. We're more likely to uh, mess something up trying to change that often than we are if we simply put them on a diet that hits the average of that population pretty effectively and sometimes overfeed slightly. Uh, to make sure that the animal has all the requirements that they need or or can all the nutrients that they need to, based upon their requirements. So the nutrient requirements of that non-lactating mare for the first one through eight. The reality is because she's not, that foal's not growing very rapidly and the mare is mature, that her requirements are very similar to that of a maintenance horse. What's a maintenance horse? Well, maintenance horse is the same as an idle gelding. I don't, and when we talk about maintenance horses or idle horses, we're not talking about horses that are housed inside and maintained inside all the time with limited exercise. We're talking about an animal that is moving around and has activity at the level of an animal that would be outside on pasture 24 hours a day, walking, running occasionally. Uh, that's kind of a maintenance horse. It's not a horse that's that's asked to do exercise beyond what it's willing to do on its own. And usually mature horses don't spend a lot of time in play, but they'll spend some. The crude protein requirements for that animal is, are, animal is really quite low, somewhere between 8 and 10% crude protein in the total diet. Energy requirements are between 2.2 megacals of DE per kilogram of feed. And if you look at corn, and corn is the highest energy feed we can possibly feed to give you some sense of what this means, corn is about 3.9 megacals of, of, of energy per, of digestible energy per kilogram of feed. So the reality is that um, corn greatly exceeds the requirements of this mare. So concentrates or very rich concentrates are probably not needed in this diet. DE is digestible energy. What is that? That's the energy that is available in a feed that an animal can absorb. Now it may not all be used as energy. It may be used for some other sort from for some other things. There'll be some loss in there as well. But it's the total amount of energy that an animal can obtain from a food, digesting it. Mineral and vitamin requirements are relatively low at this time as well because that of the maintenance horse is not high. And of greatest concern typically is calcium and phosphorus. And this is very dependent upon the type of hay or type of feed that you're, you're wanting to feed at any given time as well. Typical feedstuffs that can be used. Quite typically, we breed horses in the spring of the year. We may breed them earlier than that, but most of the time we're breeding them in the spring of the year, or at least in the early part of the year. So sometime between this in, during this period of one to eight months of pregnancy, they're likely to have the opportunity to be on pasture. 
Grass, grass pastures will work very well for this class of horses. Grass pastures at this time will be, greatly exceed the protein requirements of that animal and are likely to, to greatly succeed the energy requirements as well. Be careful uh, in terms of legume pastures on non-lactating mares. Uh, those, those types of pastures are very, very uh, high in energy. It's not going to make the animal sick other than unless you uh, don't adjust them to it uh, appropriately. Won't make the animal sick in that regard, but it may get the animal so fat that you have some real problems potentially with parturition, some problems with founder. Um, those mares that aren't lactating are, are the most difficult mares for us to manage at Michigan State. All of our mares stay outside 24-7, um, and they have the opportunity to graze pastures throughout the summer. And when we do that, uh, those mares that missed a year um, and or we left them open to breed to a particular stallion when we do get that mare bred back that mare that year is really tough on that mare because quite typically she'll get excessively fat and if she has some history of foot problems or colics and those sorts of things um, she's likely to show them at that time so we try to make sure that those horses get on the poorest quality pastures we have and even poor poor quality pastures sometimes get some way, get them way too we're looking at dry feed for those mares. Most mares, except real hard doers, uh, mares that just, and, and the one thing we can talk, I, we need to mention at this point is, we talk about horses or all animals as being an average. In all other species, we tend to, in livestock, you know, it's not, it's not uncommon to feed a pen full of 60 steers or a pen of 20 to 30 hogs. And when you're dealing with that many pigs in one pen or that many cattle in one pen, those, those animals will actually handle, handle as the average of the population. However, in horses, we tend to take those same animals and we stick them in stalls. As soon as we put them in stalls, we end up with the exception rather than the rule because you know from yourself that some of us, um, like me, I can gain weight very early at this stage in my life. When I was young, I had difficulty putting on weight no matter what I ate. And the reality is that, that people are different, horses are different. So when we put them into a stall, you need to realize that you feed, you're feeding to, to an animal that is likely to be the exception to the rule. And as a result of that, if we had, them all, if we had all 60 of them in a pen, they'd probably feed very, if you fed them to the average, you'd probably do very, very well. But when we end up putting them into a stall, um, you have to, that's when the art of feeding horses comes in. Yes, there's science associated with this, but there's art and common sense. And we make those adjustments by looking at animals, body condition scoring them, so we know what kind of body condition that animal is, is in, and what type of body condition we'd like to have them in, and then we adjust the diet to acquire that appropriate body condition. Usually first cutting uh, legume grass hay works really well for this class of horse. And that's probably all that mare needs. <clears throat> Excuse me. Trace mineral salt, calcium and phosphorus supplementation, depending on the type of hay used. And I'll, and I'll try to give you some rules of thumb to live by relative to feeds. And these don't always fall into place, but 90% of the time they do. I think the single best thing you can get from this tonight is to maybe be able to look at a diet that you're feeding a mare and say, yeah, that ought to be pretty close, or no, that's not going to work. We need to change to something else. The way you do that is by having some, <clears throat> excuse me, some sense of rules of thumb. When we talk about calcium and phosphorus content in, in feed, typically what you'll find is grass feeds or grass hays tend to be higher in phosphorus than do legume hays. Um, excuse me, look, excuse me, lower in calcium than do legume hays, and legume hays tend to be high, very high in calcium. In general, concentrates, corn, oats, barley, those types of feeds tend to be higher in phosphorus than they do in calcium and in general haze tend to be higher in calcium than they do in phosphorus. So if you feed a combination of legume grass hay you're likely to adequately meet that horse's need for calcium and phosphorus if the hay quality is reasonable and so it's totally dependent on the type of hay that you use. Late in pregnancy, the 9th, 10th, and 11th months of pregnancy, the fetus begins to grow much more rapidly. 
and the mare's ability to consume feed is reduced because of the size of the fetus. It's not that she's not hungry, it's that she has difficulty uh, trying to consume that quantity of feed uh, simply because she doesn't have room at that point. And it's important to realize this. Usually pregnant mares in the winter, um, usually mares are pregnant in the winter, uh, so that pasture is not available. So at this point, we're, burnt, we're probably going to have to put this mare on some sort of a dry feed. If you feed late in the summer, or excuse me, full late in the summer, uh, June, Ju June and July foals, those mares are likely to have pretty good pasture during the 9th, 10th, and 11th months of pregnancy. So they, they will be able to do that. But most of the time we're trying to foal mares out April or earlier, and they really don't have much of a chance to be able to use the pasture that even is available at that time. Nutrient requirements for this class um, are slightly higher. Crude protein contents of 10 to 12 percent crude protein will meet the needs of most animals um, that are that are in the 9th, 10th, and 11th months of pregnancy. Why 10 to 12 percent? Because in the early uh, earlier months, the ninth month, it's closer to 10, and then the in the 11th month, it's closer to 12 percent. And you need to realize that when we start talking about feeds in regard to pro crude protein content, excuse me. Hays typically are, good quality hays are typically very high in crude protein. For instance, a really good second or third cutting alfalfa hay might be as high as 22% crude protein. Well, the reality is there's not a single class of horse anywhere that requires 22% crude protein. And so that hay can be mixed with concentrates or grass hays to reduce that protein content um, if if you don't if you don't want to feed that high quality hay because they don't need that kind of energy. If you look at concentrates, on the other hand, oats, 12 to 13 percent crude protein. These are again rules of thumb you ought to kind of recognize uh, when you see a diet that con that is basically oats. You ought to recognize what the protein content of that feed is. Corn, somewhere between eight and nine percent crude protein. Very very good energy feed, but not a great protein feed. When we look at the energy requirements for this animal at the 9th, 10th, and 11th month of pregnancy, we're talking about considerable more energy consumption. So these animals in, the, in the, about the, the 9 per kilogram of feed, and a mega cal, I guess I should, should have mentioned that earlier, a mega cal is just a great big calorie is what that is. If you deal with calories, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> related to horses, you deal with such large numbers that it's hard for us to kind of get our minds around that. So we deal in megacals because it's a little easier to think in terms of 2.3 or 2.5 megacals rather than a really, really large number. In the 11th month of pregnancy, that mare is going to need about 2.5 megacals. She has, her, her energy requirement changes substantially at, at that time. An increase, that it, yeah, constitutes about an increase of one-eighth to one-fifth more energy than an early pregnancy. So, so that you're going to see some real differences. Uh, increase, there's going to be an increased need for vitamins and minerals. If your hay quality is really good, um, there's probably little concern for vitamins. Uh, there may be some concern for minerals because if we're going to try to feed this much more energy, the likelihood of us uh, doing that with just hay is going to be slim. So we may need to look at supplementing some uh, minerals here because the animal is going to have a real way we've changed this diet. <clears throat> Excuse me. We can use pasture. Um, legume grass pastures will work really well to supply the mare's requirements at this time. A legume grass pasture who what that typically might be if we made hay out of it it might be 18 percent crude protein. Fresh pasture it's likely to be 22, 24, sometimes even 26 percent crude protein on a dry matter so it's much higher quality than the hay. Um, pastures are usually not available at this time because we've we've kind of forced mares to foal in the early part of the year, and as a result of that, um, we have some real problems trying to get. We have some real problems um, in regard to actually trying to utilize pastures appropriately, as as was meant in nature. That's why a mare um, is seasonally polyesterous, only comes in heat. In the, in the spring of the year because she needs to rebreed so that that foal is born in the spring of the year when feed is, is in, the, in greatest abundance 
at the time uh, that she's she's uh, lactating, and typically that's going to be the spring. So, um, but we what we've done is put an artificial spring on it where feed is not in abundance, and so in fact we have to feed them uh, high quality forages to accomplish what nature would have accomplished much more easily. If we go to dry feed, we're going to have to feed concentrates and some legume grass hay of good quality. The amount of concentrates is going to be dependent upon the mare. Uh, it's going to be dependent upon um, what type of concentrate you feed and obviously the quality of hay that's going to be fed. We continue to kind of look at feedstuffs. Um, you're going to need to have a diet that's approximately 25% concentrate and 75% roughage. Again, this is a rule of thumb. It's going to it's going to depend entirely on what what kind of feed you're feeding, what kind of concentrate it is, what type of roughage it is, and that will that will change based upon the quality of each. Uh, there's going to be an increased requirement for vitamins. Um, it can be met by using good quality forage for all classes of broodmares. But we may get into a situation where we're feeding a lot more grass hay, um, and that and and that may introduce a problem relative to vitamins. So at this point, we may want to supplement. In general, good quality legume grass hays, alfalfa is the legume of choice. Good quality alfalfa hay or alfalfa grass hays are going to provide uh, all of the vitamins that that mare needs in her diet during that time frame. The other one that I don't have on the slide, and I just recognized that I didn't, uh, one that would be of value to think about at this point, is because we're feeding more concentrate, and if you remember the rule of thumbs that we talked about before, or just earlier, the rule of thumb is concentrates tend to be higher in phosphorus and lower in calcium. Roughages tend to be higher in calcium and lower in phosphorus. So as we put concentrates in the diet, we reduce the calcium content of the diet on a percentage basis. Therefore, the more concentrate we feed, the more we need to be concerned about making sure we have enough calcium. One of the nice things about alfalfa hay is it solves our protein problem because that alfalfa hay is going to be high, high protein. And the other thing it solves is our calcium problem because cal alfalfa hays are, hays are uh, extremely high in calcium when compared to other types of feeds that we typically make a wonderful complement to a lot, of, a lot of the concentrates that we actually end up feeding. Well, the lactating mare, <clears throat> excuse me. The reason I have first three months on here is one of the things that is different with horses than in some other species is we've not pushed as hard. We do it. We do select horses indirectly for lactation or milk production. Typically do that with very few types of horses. But the types of horses we do that with are those horses that are very fertility oriented and animals that have to be successful relatively, especially if we show them in halter fertilities and those sorts of events. That those animals that grow rapidly um, and the right kind of confirmation and structure during that time are the most successful. Indirectly, those mares that milk really well are the ones that do a good job of having their babies ready for the fertilities in the fall. If we sell horses early, if we sell a lot of weanlings, that fat, sassy weanling always is a little easier to sell than the one whose hair's a little rough and doesn't look uh, doesn't look the part of that that horse that you want it to be at some point in its future. So. Um, we do indirectly select for milk, milk production, but the reality is we really don't. And as a result of that, mares, in fact, I've only talked to one breeder in my lifetime who actually culled mares on milk production, and that was Louise Camp, who many of you may be familiar with in regard to breeding quarter horses. He is one of the, he is in fact the only person that I ever met that actually culled mares on milk production. Um, Early, early lactation is really where we put a substantial stress on this mare in regard to her needs. Um, she, stop, she doesn't stop lactating, but the quality and the amount of milk uh, falls out relatively, falls off relatively quickly at about six to eight weeks of lactation. So early lactation is when she really, really 
needs your help in terms of trying to provide all the nutrients that she needs to keep up with that growing fold. Her feeding program will need to change to meet those increased needs. And typically a mare's, one thing that happens is after this mare goes through parturition, she begins to recover from parturition and begins to eat more readily than she did towards the end of, of gestation. And she'll, she'll become a very aggressive eater because she's, if she's any kind of milker at all, anything she's eating, she's putting it right back into the bucket. And so as a result of that, she has a, she has a, uh, increased or more voracious appetite so she'll start eating very well one of the things that we have found and this is more um, conjecture than anything else because I've got nothing to substantiate this except for but at Michigan State we've lost um, a variety of mares at this stage in their life from colic um, because they've got all this room in their abdomen and they they um, get out and they feel good and they play and they roll and they end up in almost every case those mares that we've lost have uh, flipped their cecum and had to go in for surgery and quite typically because it's large bowel you don't recognize it soon enough because it takes a while for it to back up so that they exhibit pain and sometimes they're not great surgical risk um, so we've we've been quite careful to make sure that you want to feed them a lot of concentrate at this time because they want to milk but it may be very important to make sure that we have lots of bulk so we can fill that gut up and make sure that we have we, we reduce the amount of room so that that uh, cecum isn't quite as free floating as it was or as it is or it could be potentially if we had a lower fiber diet so we think of bulk as being very very important um, at least at the horse teaching and research center uh, this it's more conjecture and, and kind of management observation but I do think it Fiber is always important, but we we have a particular concern for it at this time of um, in in a reproductive cycle of a mare. Now the nutrient requirements of a lactating mare go up substantially. Her her requirements for crude protein is going to require a diet that's some somewhere between 14 and 16 percent crude protein. And in fact, this is probably the class with the exclusion of the early wean foal um, that has the highest crude protein requirements. Lactating mare and early lactation. 16% early lactation, 14% in late lactation. She's going to require about 2.6 megacals of DE per kilogram of total feed. That's about an increase of 30% above the requirements of the same mare in early gestation. So we have a substantial increase. I mean, she's she really is is going to need a lot more feed. She typically will eat more feed, which is which is the good thing. Um, but she's also probably going to have an increased calcium requirement because a lot of calcium is going into that milk. And then in every one of these cases, uh, in all these classes, all horses should have free choice trace mineralized salt. Even if you have salt in your concentrate um, and you have salt put into the concentrate, free choice trace mineralized salt should be available to the animal. Horses are very good heat dissipators. They dissipate heat through sweat. And when they sweat, they lose um, sodium and chloride. And as a result of that, uh, they need to replenish it. And you need to make sure that those animals have access to the salt, to salt at any time they need it. And it, it really makes it a lot easier to kind of manage them if, you'll, if you do that on a free choice basis. We can use a variety of feedstuffs at this time. One of the things that a lot of people will assume is that a lactating mare won't do well on good pasture and she has to be supplemented in some way shape or form typically if your pastures are of high quality and we're talking about a reasonable time of year you're not talking about july in michigan when we don't talking about april may and june you've got good quality pastures and if it's a legume grass pasture this will supply the needs for the mare during early lactation. As long as she has plenty of it um, and has free access to salt and water, uh, that mare should be able to do real well on good quality legume grass pastures. Alpha brown grass pastures during early spring and summer, if you look at nutrient contents, they contain about 2.7 megacals of DE. And if we'll return to our previous slide, 
notice that they re horses require about 2.6 during lactation and it contain they contain about 2.7 megacals of DE per kilogram of feed and about 15.5 percent crude protein and is is they are very high in calcium um, that is a really low estimate for pastures in regard to to um, crude protein content that was actually an estimate I took from two hays I wanted to make sure I got kind of the minimum requirement um, and those <clears throat> are the minimum number possible that greatly exceeds uh, the 14 to 16 percent that we're So a good alfalfa brome grass pasture, alfalfa grass pastures, the only grass that isn't really very high quality, I mean there's a couple of them that, that will grow voluntarily, but in terms of seeding them, uh, the only grass that really isn't a very high quality grass is, is um, Timothy, and that's really not very high quality grass when we start dealing with it. Excess crude protein, if we feed this, if we have them on a brome grass pasture, and as I mentioned earlier, a good quality brome grass pasture early in the year on dry matter basis might be as high as 22, 24% crude protein. That excess protein at that level will not cause a problem for the mare. Um, simply knock the nitrogen off the protein. She'll use that as a source of energy, the carbon skeleton as a source of energy, and she'll secrete the nitrogen in her urine. Real high levels of protein, I mean exceedingly high levels, 30, 35%, those may cause some long-term problems if you feed them for extended periods of time. But typically with, with traditional feeds that we feed, unless we're adding a lot of soybean meal to the diet, that high protein is not going to cause a problem. Dry feed and good quality hay is generally what we need to have is a good quality hay and concentrate. During lactation, that mare, depending on how well the mare does and how much, how much she's lactating, um, and that's sometimes dependent upon the foal. Um, real aggressive foals that will suckle frequently and suckle large volumes, will, and, and the more frequently they suckle, the way the mammary gland works is when you remove the milk, it tries to replace it. And so that foal that, that removes milk quickly um, is going to put a little bit more of a demand on the mare. But depending on those kinds of criteria, usually we're talking about a diet that's 50% concentrate and 50% A. So we'd have some form of a feed. Now, if you want to, we've talked a lot about corn and oats. Why do we talk about corn and oats? Because the reality is, is that when you start talking about sweet feeds or pelleted feeds or any other kind of feeds that are manufactured, the base of those feeds is quite typically corn, oats, and, and if, it's a, if they need a supplemental protein, they're likely to supplement uh, soybean meal. So it's, it's a combination of those that, um, that we're talking about whenever we talk about a sweet feed anyway. Corn and oats will, will uh, need to be supplemented with protein. Um, typically, as I mentioned, that protein's likely to be soybean meal in some form. Uh, we can do this with a sweet feed. We can simply go out and get a sweet feed that's 16% crude protein, feed that with a good quality hay, and we should be able to meet that mare's needs for energy protein very effectively. We can also do it with corn and oats. Um, oats is a very safe feed for horses and most people like feeding oats and a lot of people are afraid to feed corn. Uh, the reason for that is is that corn is a feed that you have to be pretty smart to feed um, and you have to control it. You can't just kind of feed it willy-nilly um, and you have to realize that corn has about nearly twice as much energy in it as does oats. Um, just, as does hay, and as a result of that, um, it can be it can be potentially dangerous to uh, horses. So, uh, and if if overfed uh, accidentally, or if you're feeding in a group and you're mixing oats and corn together and it's poorly mixed, um, the horses like corn, and they'll many of them will go to corn uh, much before they'll go to any other concentrate feed, and as a result of that. Uh, they'll go in, eat all the corn out of the feed, uh, end up colicking because they'll produce excess gas because they've just got way too much energy in the digestive tract uh, for the micro, um, the microflora and fauna of the hindgut.
excess gas, which will produce colic, which can be very, very, very harmful if it's allowed to progress. Trace mineral salt, calcium and phosphorus are, may need to be supplemented, again, based on the type of hay you're feeding. If you're feeding an alfalfa hay, it's unlikely that you'll have to sub supplement calcium. But if you feed a straight alfalfa hay, you may, in fact, have to supplement phosphorus. If you feed straight grass hay, you're likely to have to supplement um, calcium and may not have to supplement phosphorus. It, and it's dependent, and that we're not intending to try to formulate diets here. We're giving you some rules of thumb that we can get through in about 40 minutes uh, so that we'll, we'll be able to kind of complete a thought at least when we're done and hopefully be able to answer some of your questions after. Rules to feed by, all right? When we're talking about lactating mares, one of the, or excuse me, talking about re mares that are, are breeding mares, one of the things that, um, and this has been a myth that's been out there for a long time. Sadly, I thought it was about completely dispelled, but sadly in the last couple years I've heard of veterinarians and others making recommendations like these that are inappropriate. If, if you look at work that was done in other species, and those species, uh, primarily beef cattle is where it's been done, you'll find that fat animals have difficulty conceiving. So it's always important to have animals really lean. Because of that, many people will take mares that are overweight, and while trying to breed them, will try to get them to lose weight. This is entirely inappropriate, um, and it's a great way to reduce the conception rate in your mare. Mares that are on a positive plane of nutrition, in other words, not losing weight, they're, they, they're maintaining their body weight, those animals will always, always conceive better than animals that are losing weight. And so it's important that during the time that we're breeding the mare, trying to get her pregnant for the next foal crop, when we're trying to do that, it's important that we maintain the diet to keep that mare maintaining her weight and not losing weight. If she's thin, you can have her gain weight at that time. And if you think of this from nature's perspective, it makes total sense. Because horses are long day breeders. They breed in the summer or in the spring, or late spring, early summer. That's the time of, of, of uh, fertility. And that's when the grasses and legumes and all of the plants that they consume were going to be. during that time that animal is going to be gaining weight. If that was inappropriate for the animal and and it was not intended, Mother Nature, it would be very difficult for an animal to be able to conceive in that environment. Where you take sheep on the other hand that breed in the short days of the year and deer um, they actually breed very well if they're in relatively light weight. So it's important that while that mare is being bred that you don't have her losing weight, you have her at least maintained. Late lactation and early gestation is a good time to take weight off the mare if you have to do that if she's too fat. Don't do it in early lactation or don't try very hard in early lactation. And the other thing is if you get horses too fat, uh, sometimes you can reduce milk production because of fat deposits in the udder. So Try to maintain your horses in a decent body. Body condition score your mares after the breeding season to determine their need to late gestation. What should be the body condition score for mares? Uh, ideally, you'd have your mare in a body condition score of between five and six, uh, preferably a five, five and a half is kind of ideal. Is and that's on a body condition scoring uh, system of one through nine. Uh, so nine being very, very fat, one being absolutely emaciated, and actually a horse that is barely standing and usually has to be put down because you can't even feed him back up. So a five and a half is about where you want the mare at. That's so you can, if the mare turns right, just right, you might be able to see ribs. Um, that's a good body condition score for that mare during the breeding season and during um, jet early gestation. I actually like to have mares go into lactation just a little bit heavier than that, like a body condition score of six, because lactation is likely to take some of the fat off their back. So always body condition score your horses. Does that mean you have to go out and say this horse is a six and this horse is a five and this? No. 
need to be able to do is say, okay, that's what I think a horse ought to look like, and then look at horses relative to that and try to try to determine how you get back to what you think is an ideal body condition. If an animal is too fat, the rule of thumb is take reduce their diet by one by ten to fifteen percent, or if they're too thin, increase the diet by ten to fifteen percent in terms of the amount of energy in the diet, and that should should get you towards the um, body condition score that you're interested in achieving. Optimize growth of the foal. Don't attempt to do it through the mare. It's hard to do because she doesn't milk well enough. If you want to optimize the growth of the foal, and I, and I don't say maximize because I'm not convinced that maximization of foal growth is a good thing for anybody. Uh, I think you significantly uh, reduce the life of that offspring or many offspring. So I think optimizing the growth, that's in other words, getting them as big as they need to be genetically, but not, not trying to grow them too fast. Between those animals at three to four months of age, as the mare's not able to keep up with the foals for growth rate, if, you, if you're more concerned about socialization, the opportunity for the foals to be more active outside, because if you wean them, you've got to restrict their activity. Now, in our weaning facility, or our weaning method, we don't restrict foals' activity. We remove the mare from the pasture, and we leave the foals on the pasture, um, and that allows them to continue to exercise and do those. And we wean it about four months. Um, while that foal is, is on the mare and she's lactating, it's a great idea to start creep feeding the foal, providing an opportunity for that foal to have access to concentrate from one month of age until weaning. Um, if on pastures, they, those foals only need concentrate, you don't need to feed them any hay in that creep. They will do fine with just concentrate. Get older, they'll start eating an awful lot of feed in that environment. So um, you need to kind of keep track of it so that you make sure you're giving them what they need. You can about feed them all they want. That's not going to be a problem. Typically, you're talking about a feed that's somewhere around 15 to 16 protein and uh, is mostly kind of a corn, oats, uh, soybean meal-based feed and provides a real good opportunity to, to optimize the growth in those offspring. Conclusion, manage your marriage differently during the different stages of her production cycle. Remember that she's not, that lactating mare has a whole bunch of different requirements than the pregnant mare does. And don't try to feed them the same. If you do that, you're going you're gonna to starve one and have the other one fat or have, do, have one be adequate and the other one uh, be excessively thin. So uh, make sure that you try to uh, feed them based upon their product, the stage in their production cycle. Acquire a method for balancing rations. We've not talked at all about that. I mean, the numbers that I gave you uh, came from my ability to be able to formulate diets, figure out what those are, those approximations are. Um, but you, ne you need to try to do that. If you're going to do large numbers, if you have one horse, there's absolutely no point in you learning. You've got multiple horses. If you're, if you're folding out large numbers of mares, you need to make sure that you're in the right area. And if you're folding out large numbers of horses, it probably makes some sense to have your hay tested for um, nutrient content, primarily uh, energy and protein. That's that's the big things that you, that you need to kind of recognize adequate in those regards. Learn to objectively evaluate your mare's condition and feed her accordingly. All right, so that's kind of all I have. If I'd be happy to entertain any questions you have if you want to chat. Um, we'll do that. And somebody's already got a question on there. How about feeding some vegetable oil, sunflower oil? What kind of oil is best for each of the stages? There's very little difference in oils. Um, one of the, you can feed some oil, and when you feed oil, the thing you need to realize is what you're feeding is actually increased energy. Oil is fat. Fat has about two and a quarter times more energy in it than does. Um, Carbohydrate, and that's most of the energy that's in corn and oats is going to be in the form of carbohydrates. So as a result of that, when you feed oil, what you're doing is providing yourself an opportunity to increase the energy in the diet and provide an opportunity for the animal um, to consume more forage, which is a good thing, by reducing the amount of total concentrate, yet keeping the energy level relatively high. So 
the oil that they prefer, I mean, if you've done on tests where they've actually looked at types of oils and fats and see which of those horses prefer, one of the oils they really prefer is, is uh, corn oil. They really like corn oil. But most of those, if you buy um, feeds on the market that are fat added feeds, they're not going to put vegetable oils in them. They're typically going to use animal fat. The reason they're going to use animal fat is it's saturated fat and it doesn't run. So I can put it in a pellet and that pellet will maintain its form and it won't get to be all. So uh, I, you can feed oils. I, I mean, it's entirely up to you and whether or not you've got enough energy in the rest of your feed. Any other questions? Answer all your questions, or did I totally confuse you? <laughs> Question is um, regarding commercially bagged feeds for a mare, or should you have a diet made specifically for her needs? The reality is that if you go to a reputable company and you get a commercially bagged feed, they are formulating that feed to fulfill the requirements of every class of horse associated with, with whatever they're advertising for. So that it, you take a lactating mare, um, you'll end up with a situation where um, that feed is likely to over provide nutrients. Why? Because that feed company wants to cover their behinds. They want to make sure that Regardless of what hay you feed, they're going to be able to do uh, a good job of, of providing the nutrients. If you take into consideration the pastures, if you've got good quality pastures, um, in general, you can you can feed you could feed a commercial diet, but on good quality pastures, most of the time that's more than adequate in terms of of protein requirements or meeting the protein requirements. So I'm not sure that I'd spend a lot of time trying to buy feed in that regard. The next question, how would I deal with a five month pregnant mare who scores a high four on condition? I'd start feeding her some concentrate. I'd want at five months pregnant, I want that, if she's a high four, I'd actually like to have her gain weight. As I, as I mentioned, I'd like to have body condition scores a six when the mare starts to lactate. Because if, if that's, when she goes into lactation, um, especially if that's a young mare, you may have some real problems trying to get her, trying to keep her maintaining weight. What do you change for an older brood mare, 18 years old? If she's got a good mouth on her, not a lot. Um, if, if her mouth's bad and she's having some eating problems, then it's different. Typically, one of the things that happens with, as it does with all animals, as they get older, their lactation curve kind of falls off. So lactation is a little bit more difficult for them. Um, in, not so much more difficult for them as it is, um, they won't do as good a job as prov providing for the offspring. So you may want to push her pretty hard to make sure that she's got, she can produce all the milk that she's pos that's possible for her. Uh, but beyond that, uh, she should be at, at 18. I don't, I typically don't think of 18 year old mares. We have, um, you know, brood mares in our band that are in their 20s. Um, I like to have brood mares that old because um, I like to shorten my generation interval more than that. But um, for an older broodmare, typically, uh, if you do things very, very similarly, quality of feed is important with every single one of them. And you may want to give her a little more concentrate because it's going to be a little tougher for her to maintain herself uh, than it would be for a younger mare. If you leave your foal on the mare longer than four months still feeding her well, does it harm the mare in any way? No, um, to a point. Uh, I've actually seen farms or situations where a mare's had two foals sucking her at the same time last year's and this year's, um, that that's terribly inappropriate. Um, they need to be off by six months of age, kind of minimally. Um, there are some advantages to that. I think a disadvantage to early weaning is that you, you, you have to remember, everything we do with horses is based upon their mind and socialization, their own socialization with other horses is critical to the way they think or perceive the rest of the world. And we're finding more and more of that out as we do more and more behavioral sorts of things with all species. 
So there's some advantages to leaving them on. Four months I don't think is too early. And then the other thing, four months may be too early if you bring them in, stick them in a stall, and you don't leave them with the other horses or other foals. But if they've got the opportunity to socialize otherwise, then I think that's less of a problem. I don't think it harms the mare in any way if you hold her, if you keep it on there till six. Start doing seven, eight, nine months, then you, you then you may have some udder damage. Any other questions? But concentrate. What I recommend? Well, I'm not going to I'm not going to recommend a feed company. Um, what we feed our mares. Um, is straight oats really good quality in in, in late late gestation? They get really good quality alfalfa grass hay. In lactation, they get really good quality straight alfalfa hay. We analyzed it the other day for a project, and that hay is analyzing at 22% crude protein. That's actually better hay than they ought to be fed. Um, but we have it made on farm, so it's not something that uh, is a lot more cost prohibitive for us. Um, but we feed straight oats and soybean meal supplement. Um, those mares with that, that kind of a diet, we really don't have too much of a problem. Uh, if the mare doesn't have enough pasture for requirements, if she's outside, hay pretty much covers the basics. Um, unless, un unless you're feeding a, a re, feeding a very high percentage grass hay and again that's a situation where you might if you're feeding large numbers you may want to have it analyzed you can always mix uh, dicalcium phosphate and salt one-to-one -one, trace mineralized salt one-to-one -one, and feed it free choice um, and let them eat it to the level of salt that they want and that kind of ensures that you have enough calcium and phosphorus there we used to do a lot of that on farm because we fed a, we feeding a lot more alfalfa hay today and alfalfa grass mixes. Uh, we don't worry about that quite as much as we once did. Is there any difference if some of the extra protein has been given by using soy? Protein's protein, doesn't matter what the source is. Um, that's the one thing that when I taught vet school nutrition for eight years, the hardest thing to get across to students, um, especially when you start talking about dog and cat nutrition and um, because People actually believe that you know dogs absolutely have to have meat. Well, the reality of it is that the number one ingredient in 98% of the dog foods in the United States is corn. Animals don't have requirements for, in, for ingredients, they have requirements for nutrients. And that's the thing that you really need to be, you need to be, it doesn't matter where the protein comes from, it's still protein. Is there more concern with alfalfa hay i.e. mold, etc. You're, you're absolutely right. And the reason for that is, is especially first cutting alfalfa hay, the reason is, is that the stem is larger. And you'll find that some people do a poor job of making it. The beauty of ours, the, our situation is at the university is that my son is actually in charge of university farms, and if the hay isn't made right, I can give him all sorts of dickens about it. And we get we get pretty good quality hay. And, if, and the other thing is, is because we're we're making hay and silage and everything else. If the hay isn't right or we can't make hay, we blow it into silos and wait until the day we can make hay. But that tends to be the greatest concern with, with legume hays is if it's made wrong, you can end up with more molds. And you should be able to identify that pretty easy if you can if you be, become accustomed to looking at high quality hays. That's exactly right. Amanda Amanda answered that perfectly. <laughs> I'm sorry, Amanda, if I'd have read your answer we'd have been I could have just shut up there you're more than welcome Diana do you prefer trace mineral salt over other mineral blocks with plain salt blocks um, I I prefer what the heck just happened there um, I prefer trace mineralized salt blocks over other mineral mineral blocks uh, simply because there's, if you allow them to get the individual minerals on their own, and that's been shown in a number of studies, they don't do a good job of trying to balance that. If you allow that, if you just give them a trace mineralized salt, the excess of those minerals that are in that trace mineralized salt will not cause problems. And the reality is that for the most part, um, those, those salt blocks, um, trace mineralized salt blocks, um, are 
always formulate it a little bit in excess of what the animal needs based upon what you're getting in the hay, grain, and the dirt that the animal consumes. What's the difference between trace mineralized salt and other mineral blocks? One of the things you need to look at, and, and I always recommend that in horses, that you really ought to feed trace mineralized salt with selenium added in the block form. The reason in Michigan, because that's the easiest way to get selenium in horses, and it and it will if they have access to a say, a salt block, they will they will meet their selenium needs with it. The difference, Brook, is that white salt blocks contain salt and one other mineral in Michigan, and that one other mineral is typically iodine. Trace mineralized salt contains all of the trace minerals. Trace minerals are copper, iodine, cobalt, molybdenum, uh, manganese, I'm gonna, not going to be able to name them, chlorine, uh, iron, copper. Those, those are the trace minerals that are needed. Zinc, thank you. Uh, <laughs> that, that helped. Um, they're, they're, those are the ones that are, that are going to be needed um, that are, are um, in the diet, or excuse me, in trace mineralized salt, and typically are going to be formulated in a way that it will meet the horse's need. What does selenium exact, uh, do for a horse exactly? Oh, that's another lecture. Um, that was what I did my PhD on. Um, what selenium, selenium and vitamin E work in concert in the horse's body to protect the horse from what is the most dangerous compound that all of us take in our bodies, and that's oxygen. When we, when we process food, we, break, we take O2 and we break it down to two separate oxygen molecules. Those oxygen molecules are very reactive, and they can form things like hydrogen peroxide, and you know what hydrogen peroxide does when you put it on live cells. You've seen that. It bubbles because it's blowing those live cells up. Um, it does the same thing inside the animal's body. So if what happens is that when you have an animal that has a failure of the selenium um, vitamin E complex, which is, is a lot more complicated than that, but that's the simplest way to say it. Selenium actually is part of an enzyme called glutathione peroxidase that protects the cell from hydrogen peroxides and lipid peroxides. Um, don't do that, the cell has damage and you, you lyse the contents of the cell and the cell dies. And it happens mostly with muscle. In, in case of lambs and in white muscle disease and horses even, uh, they may die in young horses, they may die. And, and what, may, what, may, what caused that is actually um, it attacks the heart muscle as well. So it's really a heart attack. With selenium in the feed and a TM salt block, when should we worry about too much selenium? Uh, it, if, you've got, if you've got a reputable feed company that's formulating the diet selenium selenium was first discovered as a toxic element but the reality is there's a fairly substantial range between what causes toxicity and what's put into a feed and with the selenium what you're going to do is assure that the animal has adequate selenium in the diet if you're feeding both of those and you're going to be at maximum you're going to be probably somewhere around 0.2 part per million and 0.2 part per million is way below what's going to end up causing toxicities in horses. So it's not anything you need to worry about. Anything else? Not, we're getting close to the end of the hour here, so. Thank you. I hope... It was. It, I hope we accomplished something. It's a. It's difficult to try to talk about this in anything that, any way that makes sense or the way you can complete a thought in 40 minutes. I mean, it's kind of a. To me, as I mentioned, this is probably a four-hour lecture. <laughs> You're more than welcome. Thank you. Thanks again for all of you attending this live web presentation tonight. If you have questions, please feel free to email info at myhorseuniversity.com. And our next web presentation is going to be with Dr. Brian Nielsen, Conditioning Your Horse for the Show Season. And you can sign up on our website at www.myhorseuniversity.com. Thanks again for attending. <laughs>